All right, let's open up our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. And just to let you know, too, we'll also be looking at uh, the first and second chapter of Exodus as well. So it might be wise to mark your spot there. But when you get there, please stand. We'll honor the reading of God's Word. And uh, just to let you know, we actually... We'll be looking mainly, well, really just in Hebrews at verse 23, because when I got to putting all my research and study notes together, uh, that's all I figured we could cover in a Sunday morning. And so we'll cover uh, 24 through 26 tonight. But Hebrews 11, 23 through 26. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child. And they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you again. Lord, we can't thank you enough for, for all the blessings that are in our lives and, and, and everything that we give to you was yours anyway. And Lord, we, we thank you for that. And Lord, we just pray this morning as we read and study your word, Lord, that you'd open up our hearts, our minds, our ears. Lord, that um, you would overcome my ins insignificance. And Lord, that the word would be spoken. And Lord, that they would hear your words and not my own. And Lord, that your Holy Spirit would convict us and encourage us and, and whatever the desired result, whatever is needed in each individual person this morning. Lord, we pray that you would uh, accomplish that. And Lord, it's in your son's precious, holy, wonderful name we pray. Amen. All right, so as we are studying Hebrews 11, and we've talked about how it's the Hall of Fame of Faith, using as an example, using those who came before us as an example, and how they lived by faith. Okay, that is what in Hebrews 12 says is the great cloud of witnesses. And we spent quite a bit of time, quite a bit of time the last couple of weeks on Abraham, and rightfully so. But now we come to Moses, and we'll spend today, tonight, and probably next Sunday morning on some of the events that illustrated his faith in God, okay, the, his life of faith. And he's one of those, Moses is, whose life and the events that uh, his life includes encapsulates a whole lot of Scripture. I mean, we're reading about Moses from the second chapter of Exodus to the end of Deuteronomy. And then he's also, like mentioned in Hebrews, he's mentioned in the Gospels uh, as far as God delivering the law to him and him leading the Israelites through the wilderness. He wrote Psalm 90. We see his presence there. And so he touches a whole lot of Scripture. But outside of Scripture, we also look at it other than Jesus, there's probably more uh, written and shown about him than anybody else in the Bible especially as far as media, as far as movies go, okay? Because uh, you've got the old Ten Commandments movies, got Charlton Heston, they redid that, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago. And then there's an animated story of it called The Prince of Egypt. And so you see these uh, accounts of Moses and, and the events of his life and how God worked through him, whether in the movies and cartoons, we see that more so outside of Scripture than any other person than Jesus, from what I could tell. I mean, of course, there's more about Jesus. But when you look at it, the, everybody else, there's, I think there's more about Moses than there is David or Paul or any of the other apostles. And all those that we see how great a man Moses was and how great a God it was or is that he served. But when we read the Holy Scripture, one thing it, that we see, and this is something that I never realized, kind of like what Robin was talking about uh, you know, a lot of people don't know that God said, hey, send seven of each of the clean animals. And she showed how the kids didn't know that. Well, with Moses, one of the things I didn't realize until I read the Bible myself, it was his insignificance. You know, we, we watched the Ten Commandments, and I don't recall them ever really mentioning much 
of his stutter. And it's been a long time that, since I've watched that movie. Now, we do see that he was a murderer, but we don't see, you know, his, his faults as far as he, what he thought his incapabilities were. And once we notice that, we look at, hey, if God can use Moses, well, he can use somebody like me. You know, he can use somebody like this person that used to be homeless or this person who used to be an addict or this person who stutters or this person who feels like they're not comfortable speaking in public. And so we see how God can greatly use any vessel. And Moses is not the only example of that. We see that in Paul. We see it in David. Okay, we see it in people like Elijah and Jephthah and some of the judges. You know, we see how God can use anyone as a vessel for his glory. And so through Scripture, we see that Moses, who was a murderer, God used him as a deliverer. We see that how he didn't have confidence in, in speaking publicly and, and going to somebody like Pharaoh. He said, I'm slow of speech, which means he stuttered and, and had a hard time with it, but yet God used him and his brother Aaron to rebuke the most powerful world leader of the day in Pharaoh. And so as we look at these great men and, and women in the Bible and how God used them, what a lot, a lot of times we focus on is what they accomplished, the great acts. Okay, so we don't think of Moses, like I said, we don't think of his insignificancies as much as, hey, they crossed the Red Sea. He led them out of Egypt. You know, he stood on the mount while Joshua was fighting and held up his arms. We think of those things. But one thing that, that I feel we need to notice more, and, and I notice it more as I read and as I study, and as we just got through studying the book of Acts on Wednesday nights, and as we've been studying in Hebrews, what I see more and more is not so much what they accomplished, but what they had to give up, what they had to count as loss. And so I keep going back to Philippians 3.8, where Paul writes, Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. And so this proclamation of Paul describing what he has cast aside to serve Christ is not just isolated to him. You will not find a single great Christian leader or great Christian period who has not counted something as loss that previously was important to them. And Moses is no different. Okay, Moses is the same. We'll, and we'll concentrate more on this tonight. But it says here in Hebrews that he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. We don't realize what Moses gave up as being a prince of Egypt to do what God called him to do. I mean, Moses had his whole life set, and he gave it up for the calling of God. And so he is another example of someone counting those things that we have a hard time giving up on. Okay, Moses had all the riches that one could want with his status in Egypt. And then when he was 40 years old, he threw it away. But then another aspect in the acts of faith in the lives of the saints that is noted, every instance just about, and, and, I, and I can't think of one where you don't, but I'll keep it generic, but every instance when you're acting on faith, you have to overcome fear. You have to overcome a fear. And so you have to put those aside, and, and we've often seen the motto in recent times, faith over fear. And, and a lot of people, uh, they use it to apply it to whether you should take a shot or wear a mask. When the Christian absolutely needs to live faith over fear, but it's not just about that. It's about whether you're going to live for the gospel of Christ, whether you're going to be able to count things as, as loss in faith, or do you fear losing those things? Or do you fear putting those things aside? Or do you fear the reproach of the world when you truly follow Jesus Christ, that's what faith over fear means. Because we have to look at it. Are we going to fear the reproach that we receive because we follow Christ? Because the world 
hates Christ. Jesus tells us that. Look, they don't hate you. They hate me. And, and are you going to fear how they speak to you about it or how they look at you? And too many times we want people to like us. We want people to accept us. And so there's times we may get around a certain crowd and we don't bring up church. We don't bring up Jesus Christ. We don't bring up the gospel. We don't bring up our faith. Because we want them to like us. We don't want to put them off. We don't want it to be uncomfortable. We want, don't want it to be awkward. Look, I can guarantee you um, when they have that Halloween bash in Gornsville, and there's going to be people not want to talk to us and we're going to hand them gospel tracts. And, and there'll be people, and the, when you see people in a setting like that and you ask them if they're saved, everybody's saved. Because they don't want to talk to you. They think if they say you're, they're saved, you'll leave them alone and they can go on. But when you press them, say, are you born again? They'll get mad at you. And they'll say, leave me alone. It's none of your business. And, and I've, had, I've had people tell me that, that people that's quit coming to church, and I ask them, so why would you quit coming? Well, it's none of your business. I've been told that. Cleet's been told that. He was with me. And so we need to put those fear of those moments aside and preach the gospel again. Paul said, Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel of Christ. And that wasn't just a calling for Paul. Okay? We are, as disciples, every one of us here, if we're born again, is a disciple of Christ. And who did he tell to go make disciples? Disciples. We are to go and make disciples. But we want to leave it to maybe the preacher or to the elders or someone who feel that's their calling. No, everyone who is born again, their calling is to make disciples. Every single one. But yet we fear. You know, I, I see it in teenagers. They may invite somebody to church and they may be afraid for them seeing them sing and following along. Or, you know, we have all these weird fears that we worry about people and when we look at it, it's just so insignificant. But Moses is an example of putting those fears aside. Now in Hebrews, when faith is mentioned first in regards to Moses, it's not the faith of Moses that is mentioned. It is the faith of his parents, Amram and Jochebed. And so we see in verse 23, it says, By faith... Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandments. Moses wasn't exercising any faith as a newborn baby. All he knew was whether he was hungry or whether his cloth diaper or whatever they used that day was full. That's all he knew. And so he wasn't exercising any faith, so it was the faith of Amram and Jochebed, his parents, his father and mother. And so they hid him for three months so his life could be saved. And I don't know if he got too loud as he got, became a three-month-old or what have you, but they could not hide him anymore. And so in Exodus chapter 1, we get to the point and see why they hid him. And these are, these are familiar stories, but they... Uh, they need to be touched on. Exodus 1, verses 8 through 12. It says, Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. He said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us. And so get them up out of the land. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Python and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew and they were grieved because of the children of Israel. So the more they were afflicted, the more they grew, and the more Pharaoh's fear grew. And so when we look historically, we're talking about a Pharaoh came to rise up into power that did not know Joseph. We know Joseph was way up in Egypt. I mean, he had a very high position of authority, and that's how he was able to take care of his father Jacob and the rest of the family. But the, the Hebrews were growing so much that Pharaoh was scared. And that, hey, if we go to war, they might join with the other side and we are toast. They feared them. 
But it says, so we're going to set taskmasters over them. We're going to make them slaves. We are going to control them. We are going to put them under our, our thumb. But it says, the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And that's a lesson I think that we can take as Christians today. When you see the greatest growth in the church, it wasn't because they had it easy. It wasn't because they were free to worship as they chose. The greatest periods of growth in the church was when they were being persecuted. And we see that illustrated here in Exodus. The more the Hebrews were persecuted when they were living in Egypt, the more Egypt afflicted them, the more they grew. The more the church is afflicted, the more they will grow. And so often our prayer as a church we may, or as churches in general say, well, let us get more money so we can do more in the ministry, you know, so we can bring in more people so we can grow. But that's not the right, that's not the right path. Historically, you see, now you're not going to pray for affliction, but when it comes, what you need to do is pray for strength and get through it that God would lead you through it. And so they were afflicted. The more they were afflicted, the more they grew. And so we see Pharaoh's command in Exodus 1, 16 and 17. He's talking to the Hebrew midwives. It says in verse 15, their names were Shiphrah and Puah. But he said, when ye do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then ye shall live. She shall live. But the midwives feared God, did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. And so Pharaoh had commanded them, hey, kill the male children, kill the boys. But they didn't. Now, what we will see is those Hebrew midwives were blessed because they saved the lives of those boys. <laughs> and I always thought this was funny. In verse 19, when Pharaoh asked them, okay, why have you done this? Why have you saved the men children alive? And the midwife said unto Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. So basically they're saying, man, they're quick. By the time we get there, that baby's delivered and, you know, it's too late to kill him in. But it says because the Hebrew midwife saved those children, God blessed them. It says in verse 21, It came to pass because the midwives feared God that he made them houses. They pleased God by saving the lives of those children. And so, but when Pharaoh's command didn't work, he issued another one. We see that in verse 22 in Exodus 1. It says, And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. And so the purpose of this was to keep the Hebrews from growing. Okay? Keep the women. The, the Egyptians would use them or something. But kill the men. We don't want them. But Jochebed, Moses' mother, conceived and gave birth to him and in faith hid him for three months. And she did this because in Exodus it says that he was a goodly child. We see that in chapter 2, verse 2. The woman conceived, bare a son. When she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him for three months. Now, and that goodly just simply means good. Okay? Now, I have never seen a mother that did not think her child was good in some shape, form, or fashion. My wife used to fuss at me because I'd say, all babies are ugly. She said, you ain't going to say that about yours. But all parents, they, they think their children are just perfect. And you know what? My mind changed once I had children. And then we look in Hebrews 11, in verse 23, it says that he was a proper child, which in the Greek means that he was exceeding fair, or he was pleasing. Again, that goes right along with any other parent's opinion of their child. But in Acts 7, Stephen is preaching, and he's covering Moses. And when you read the sermon of Acts 7, he covers just about the whole Old Testament. And he, and he shows how the Pharisees and how the Israelites of that day should be convicted and how they've rejected Jesus Christ. But in chapter 7, verse 20, he says, In which time Moses was born, 
and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. It's a little bit different there in, in Acts chapter 7, verse 20. So for that, that phrase, exceeding fair, there's three Greek words. And what they mean is pleasing to God. So it wasn't just that Moses was a cute little baby in his mama's eyes, but he was pleasing to God as a baby. And so that means that he was called, there was a calling on the life of Moses from the womb. Now, it's not recorded whether Jochebed knew of this calling. You know, as Elizabeth did of John the Baptist, as Mary did of Jesus and what they were to be. But in faith, she saw that he was pleasing to God and she saved him alive for three months in their house. And she did it in faith. She put away the fear of the king's commandment who said, put all these children to death. Throw them in the river. Now, technically, she followed the commandment. She put him in the river. But she saved him alive. But she risked her life to do it. She did it by faith. And what she had to do was give him up. She was relinquishing custody of her child to someone else. And we see that in Exodus 2, 3. It said, When she could not longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river's bank. But she took a basket, she waterproofed it, and she put it into the Nile while Pharaoh's daughter would be there bathing. And we read on in chapter 2, verses 4 through 9. It says, And his sister, and that's Miriam, stood afar off to wit or to know what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go, and the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And so Pharaoh's daughter heard the baby crying, and Miriam's kind of afar off, and she's watching all this transpire. And it says Pharaoh's daughter knew it was a Hebrew baby. And I think we talked about this on a Wednesday night a while back a little bit, that it's possible because he was circumcised, that that's how she knew it was a Hebrew baby. But Miriam comes up to the daughter of Pharaoh, and she says, Do you want me to find a woman to nurse that baby? She didn't go up and say, Hey, what are you going to do with that baby? But so she implied hey, that she was going to take care of it. And that could have prodded her in a certain direction. What, I, what we definitely see is God was protecting Moses. God had a calling on Moses' life. But she said, would you like me to call a Hebrew woman to nurse this baby for you? And Pharaoh's daughter commanded her to go and find a nurse for the child. And Miriam just so happened to know a woman. I know somebody. And so, she, so the baby is taken to the mother to Jochebed. Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me. And I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And so verse 9 is a similar picture to what we saw last week with Abraham and Isaac. In that she gave Moses up, but yet she received him back. Abraham gave Isaac up, but yet received him back. He, come, he knew he was going to come back down the mountain with him. We see that when Hannah gave Samuel to the Lord. She had been barren. She said, if you give me a child, I will give him to you. And when she did, she received three sons and two daughters, and she still got to take care of Samuel. She would visit him once a year and take him a, a cloak or a tunic. And so... She gave up the baby who would be called Moses. It was Pharaoh's daughter who named him because Moses means I drew him out of the water. But she received him back. 
And not only that, she was paid to raise her own son. That sounds like a pretty good deal, right? Being paid to nurse your own child. But she was also able to raise him as a Hebrew for a time. Now, there's no agreement on how long she had him. But there are some that think that she had custody of Moses till he was 12 years old. Now, you think about that. She was able to raise him in the oral traditions of the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, for up to 12 years. And some of that took hold because we see in Exodus chapter 3, verse 6, when God calls to Moses out of the burning bush, he says, Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses knew who he was because it said, And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. He knew who was de dealing with him out of that burning bush. And that came from how his mother and his father raised him in Egypt. So as God pronounced himself, Moses knew who he was and he feared him. So God allowed Amram and Jochebed to lay the foundation of Moses' faith. He, he put into practice what Paul wrote in Ephesians 6, 4 that we read earlier. says, Ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. As long as he was in the household of Hamram and Jochebed, which were both Levites, as long as he was in their household, you could tell they brought him up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And so we go to that uh, verse that we always like to quote in Raising Children, Proverbs 22, 6, Train up a child in the way he should go. When he was old, he will not depart from it. There's not a better illustration anywhere than Moses. Because the time that they had spent with him, they trained him up in the way he should go. Then she turned him over to Pharaoh's daughter. And up to the time he was 40 years old, he was in that household. But what do we see? He did not depart from how he was raised. Because we see in Hebrews that he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter esteeming the reproach of Christ with the Israelites greater than the life of sin that he would have had had he remained in the house of Pharaoh. So when Moses was 40 years old, we see the example of him not departing from the faith. And so we see that the events of Genesis concerning creation, the fall, the flood, the Tower of Babel, the, the life of Abraham, the life of Isaac, the life of, life of Jacob, how Joseph how he brought Jacob and his family to Egypt and God protected him through that, Moses knew all that. For one, I think Moses had a pretty good grasp on it before God revealed it to him to write it down in the book of Genesis. He had heard all this before he was going to write it down for eternity. But him living with Amram and Jochebed that laid the foundation of his faith and how God would use him. And that faith started with his parents. Despite his deficiencies, Moses' obedience to God would add him to the great cloud of witnesses. And so what we've got to remember is we have people in our circle that look to us. Moses was dependent on Amram and Jochebed. Whether you have children or not, there's people who look to you in their life of faith. What are they going to see? Are they going to see that your faith is part-time? Are they going to see your faith is full-time? Are, are they going to see sacrifices for your faith? Or are they going to see sacrifices of your faith? What do they see? What's, what's what we're showing them? And so the lives of our children, the lives of those around us are affected by our faith, as Moses was by Amram and Jochebed. You know, to be cliche, they chose faith over fear. Too often times, we don't. We fear not having enough money. We fear the awkward public discourse. Or we just fear being called idiots for following Christ. But God rewarded them 
And they worked mightily through Moses, delivering the people of Israel, and thus painting the picture of our exodus, our freedom, our deliverance from the bondage of sin. That's what God did with Moses. And we'll look at more, more tonight of what Moses gave up. But I'll leave you and close with this. Romans 1, 16 through 17, talking about faith and, the, and overcoming the fear of it. Paul wrote, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Why should we be afraid to speak the gospel to somebody? That's the only way they will be saved is to hear and respond to the gospel. It says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you thankful and